Hi, I'm Lolo Zuai, and I'm a singer-songwriter. And I'm going to be talking about The Birth of Venus by Sandro Botticelli. You know this painting. You know this body and this face. You've seen it in books, on posters, on t-shirts, on softwares, in Andy Warhol's computer work, and even on Lady Gaga's art pop album cover. This is Venus. She's the goddess of beauty. She was born perfect, a full-grown woman out of a shell, kind of like me. <laughs> and as we see, she's blown to the shore of her homeland by Zephyr, god of winds, and the nymph Chloris. The horror of springtime is there, waiting to greet her and cover her in a beautiful cloak. This masterpiece is the work of Sandro Botticelli. He painted it on a huge canvas at the end of the 15th century. It's now celebrated as one of the icons of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, with La Primavera by the same artist, painted on the same scale. So you know this painting, but did you get a closer look? The birth of Venus is singular in many ways. First, because of this beauty standing naked in front of us at the very center of the painting. At the time, you didn't really paint naked people except to showcase the innocence of the Garden of Eden, or to humiliate the sinners. Look at her. She's modest, clumsily hiding her breast and groin. She's delicate, beautiful, without being overly voluptuous. The proportions of her body don't respect the rules of the classical paintings. Her shoulders are falling, her neck is super long, but it doesn't matter, she's graceful. Look at this melancholic look. She's absent, smiling in her thoughts. And even when you get closer, she's looking elsewhere her small mouth barely smiling. You can only guess a reverie by looking at the corner of her lips. Do you remember Beyonce's pregnancy pictures? It's kind of the same look on her face. Venus's whole face is very softly painted, as are her breasts, contrasting with the rest of the painting where you can clearly see the very precise lines on the contour of the bodies, the hands, the feet, even the hair, which was really unusual at the time and was probably due to Botticelli's original training as a goldsmith. At the dawn of the Renaissance, painters were more likely to soften the edges to give a more natural feel to their works. But this isn't the only thing that makes this painting strangely unique. The landscape behind Venus is also very flat, quite basic, at a time where painters were making them rich and very detailed. Funny that David LaChapelle would use Hawaii as a background of his own, Rebirth of Venus, 500 years later. Also, just give a look at this laurel tree on the right side. It's quite flat, almost symbolic. It was probably inspired by the tapestry art, common on the walls of rich bedrooms at the time, a place where this painting was destined to be hung, as it was requested by a rich man, probably Lorenzo de Pier Francesco de Medici. Thank you to my ex-boyfriend who was Italian for that one. But all is not flat. Watch how Venus's gorgeous red hair is lifted by the wind blown by Zephyr and Chloris. How the flower fabric is plastered against Hora's body. Everything is softly sensual from the way the hands, the legs, and the arms of Zephyr and Chloris intertwine to the whole movements made by their blow. But this sensuality did not please everyone. Because 10 years after the painting was made, a fanatic preacher called Salvanarole took over Florence and started a crazy puritanical campaign. Botticelli himself started burning his own works, going back to purely Christian paintings. Can you imagine? The birth of Venus was not destroyed, but it was quickly forgotten. Oddly enough, the masterpiece came back in the spotlight because of English Puritans of the 19th century who used it to showcase a respectable nude to oppose the luscious scenes that were hype at the time. Thanks to them, and maybe now thanks to me, you've seen Venus everywhere. Arrivederci!